Well, let's have a word of prayer together and we'll get right into the book of Revelation. Father God, we want to thank you and praise you for your presence in our midst. We thank you for the opportunity that we have to come together like this and worship you in spirit and in truth. We pray that as we focus our thoughts upon this great book of Revelation that you will reveal yourself to us, Father. Teach us your ways. Open our eyes and help us to see wonderful things in the living Word of God. Bless each and every one that's here and those that are watching online. We just pray that you would minister to them as well. So we pray that you would open our eyes and help us to see wonderful things in the revealed Word of God. And we'll give you the praise for it, Father, as we ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen and amen. If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to the seventh chapter of the book of Revelation. And uh, tonight we're going to take up the second half of this seventh chapter. And I'm reading at verse 9, and uh, we'll read through verse 17. So hear the word of the Lord. John writes, After this I looked, and there was a vast multitude from every nation, tribe, people, and language which no one could number, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. And they were clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who is seated on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels stood around the throne, and along with the elders and the four living creatures, they fell face down before the throne, and they worshiped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and forever. Amen. Then one of the elders asked me, Who are these people with white robes, and where did they come from? I said to him, Sir, you know. Then he told me, These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. And for this reason, they are before the throne of God, and they serve him day and night in his temple. And the ones seated on the throne will shelter them. They will no longer hunger they will no longer thirst. The sun will no longer strike them, nor will any scorching heat. For the Lamb who is at the center of the throne will shepherd them, and he will guide them to springs of the water of life, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. May God add his blessing to the reading of his precious word. Now, uh, tonight I, I uh, we're going to be talking about the great multitude, who this great multitude is here in this seventh chapter. And uh, I have an outline, I think it's up on the screen for you. The great multitude, verses 9 and 10. Then the praise of the great multitude in verses 11 and 12. Then the identity of the great multitude. Who are these people? Where are they coming from? The identity of the great multitude is found in verses 13 and 14. And then there are promises made to this great multitude in verses 15 through 17. So that's our, that's our outline for this evening. Now, so far in our study, we have seen six seals opened by the Lamb of God and these six seals included war, followed by civil strife, followed by famine, and then the fourth rider was the horse with the rider who was named Death. It includes also martyrs under the altar in heaven asking for God to avenge their deaths. But the response was to them by our Lord, just a little while longer, as there are more martyrs yet to come. So, now as believers, I want to stress the fact 
that God's Word teaches us that as Christians, you and I are not appointed unto wrath, but unto salvation through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now last week, as we saw how God seals his own during this time that is known as the Great Tribulation, and we said that the seal signifies three things. It signified that we are his possession. We're no longer our own. We've been bought with a price. We belong to him. He has sealed us with the Holy Spirit. We are his, his possession. But we are also now under his protection. He has committed himself to protect us and preserve us until the day of redemption when he comes back to receive us unto himself. And then also he is our, our preservation. He is going to preserve us not only in this life, but we are preserved throughout the life that is yet to come. He's going to raise us up. Even if we die, he says he's going to raise us up in that day and give us new bodies like unto his glorious body. So in other words, we are delivered from God's wrath. And I want to emphasize that, that we're not appointed to wrath. However, I do uh, want to um, assure you that the scripture doesn't say that we are not appointed unto tribulation or suffering, or hardship, or pain. So nowhere in the scripture does it say that as believers we are exempt from persecution or even martyrdom. In fact, as the end of the age draws near, Satan's wrath is going to increase towards the believer, and we will be, the, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 20, you're going to be hated of all nations for my name's sake. But be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. You will overcome it as well as, as I did. And he said, if, you, if they persecuted me, they're also going to persecute you. Jesus said, so as the age progresses, Christians can expect to see more and more suffering, more and more hardship, more and more persecution. Now, while it is true that persecution will increase, the Bible assures us that we will ultimately be victorious. We're on the winning side. And this, Jesus said, he that endures to the end, the same will be saved. But unbelievers are going to face the awful righteous wrath of a holy, omnipotent God. So as we study this passage this evening, I want you to notice that it is filled with joy. So I want you to be encouraged and may it also compel us to invite and encourage others as well. So let us now consider what does the Bible have to say about this great multitude. And I want to read again verses 9 and 10. Verse 9 says, After this I looked and there was a vast multitude from every nation, tribe, people, language, which no one could number. That's an innumerable host of people here that's in view, and they are all standing before the throne of God and before the Lamb, and notice what they're wearing. It says that they were dressed and clothed in white robes. They had palm branches also in their hands, and they cried out in a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who is seated on the throne and to the Lamb. Now, who are these people? Well, there are those that suggest that this group that we see here, this vast multitude, is the same group as we saw last week when we talked about the 144,000. They say that these are one and the same. There are those that say that the 144,000 represents simply a perfect number. 12 times 12 times 1,000 representing all of God's people sealed during the tribulation. But this is purely speculative. It does not agree with what is clearly stated in the Word of God. I want you to note that there are some differences in these two groups of people that we see. The 144,000, which is the first group, are seen on earth, while the great multitude is seen in heaven. That's the first difference. 
The second difference is the 144,000 are said to be Jews from all the 12 tribes of the nation of Israel. The great multitude is from every nation, tribe, and tongue. Then there's a third difference. The 144,000 is a specific number, while the great multitude is an innumerable host, so many that John says they, they just could not be counted. They could not be numbered. So then who are they? Well, they are identified for us a little later on in this text, and we're going to get to it this evening, Lord willing. You will remember last week that I made the statement that the reason for this pause that we have here, this, we're in a pause here between the sixth seal and the seventh seal. The sixth seal has been opened, but the seventh seal has not yet been opened. And I, rem I mentioned that there was this pause. There was, uh, commentators refer to it as an interlude, a parenthesis, call it what you will, but it is a pause. And I said to you that the Lord is holding back the four angels and the winds of destruction and judgment upon the earth so that God was able to attend to some unfinished business, some unfinished promises that he made to his people long time ago. Genesis chapter 12. In fact, I think it's up on the board. And I'm going to read it from my Bible. In, in Genesis chapter 12, this is a promise that God made to Abraham. It's a covenant that God made with Abraham. And it's an unconditional covenant. It's an everlasting covenant. It, it doesn't, never runs out. It's never going to run out. And in Genesis chapter 12, notice what the Lord says to Abram. The Lord said to Abram, go from your land, your relatives, your father's house, to the land that I will show you. And I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and I will curse anyone who treats you with contempt. And all the peoples of earth will be blessed through you. Now, could this be partially in fulfillment what we see here in this great massive crowd of people from all nations, all kindreds, all tongues. Could this be the fulfillment of that promise that all the families of the earth are to be blessed through Abraham? Now, I say absolutely yes. Well, let's think of it for a minute. The Messiah came to us through who? Well, through Abraham, through Isaac, through Jacob through Judah, on to David, all the way up to Jesus and the son of Mary and more, the very son of God. God renewed this promise again and again down through the time of the Old Testament. God, God renewed it to Isaac in Genesis chapter 26. He renewed it again to Jacob in Genesis chapter 28. Notice especially also the words that are stated in Revelation 6 at verse 17. Revelation 6 at 17, it says, Because the great day of their wrath has come, who is able to stand? That's an important question for us to address, to think about. Who is able to stand? Well, chapter 7 is the answer to that question. Look at verse 9. Verse 9 of our text in, in, Rev, in Revelation chapter 7, at verse 9, it says, I looked, and there was a vast multitude from every nation, every tribe, every people, every language, which no one could number, standing there before the throne of God. There is your answer as to who will stand, those that are standing in the very presence of God at this time, as John views this great, great multitude. It's all those that know Jesus as their Redeemer and Lord. 
It's all those who have surrendered their life to the lordship of Jesus Christ and who believe in the gospel. They alone will be able to stand before the throne and before the Lamb of God because they have made their robes white in the blood of the Lamb. Jesus said, right, <laughs> wide is the road. Wide is the road that leads to destruction and many there be that find it. But the road to life is narrow and few there be that find it. These are the only ones that are able to stand. Note also that this great multitude, what they were wearing. It says in verse 9 that they were wearing white robes. They were clothed, it says, in white robes with palm branches in their hands. Now, white stands for the righteousness of the saints. This great multitude consists of people who are clothed with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Because the Bible says we have no righteousness of our own. All of our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. But we have been clothed. If you that are sitting here this evening, you've been clothed with the righteous robes of Jesus Christ. When he looks upon you, he sees no sin. Because his righteousness has been imputed unto you. And they stand before the throne of God clothed in his righteousness because he purchased them. They are his possession. They bear his name. They wear the seal of the living God in their foreheads. Notice also that they are carrying palm branches in their hands. And palm branches are another symbol of victory and celebration. You will recall when Jesus rode into the city of Jerusalem on the colt of a donkey and the people, they made a path of palm branches and they took their cloaks off and they laid them down and made a path over which the Son of Man could trod and they said and cried out, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. And they thought at that time that Jesus was going to be coming as their deliverer and that they, he would be their victorious king. But they did not understand that Jesus had only come to deliver them from their sin. And he was going to come again in the future as their coming king. But here this crowd that John sees in heaven cries out with a loud voice saying in verse 10, salvation belongs to our God who is seated on the throne and to the Lamb. And you'll notice how both the Father on the throne and the Lamb, the Son, are equated and praised as God. How are they praised? Well, note the word, salvation belongs to our God, they cried out. It simply means that salvation comes no other way. There is just no other way to salvation. There's only one way that man can be saved. It can only be found in God the Father through Jesus Christ the Son. Salvation is something that belongs to them. They own it and therefore they alone can bestow it. Salvation comes from God alone. It is the Father, God, who sits upon the throne. He's sovereign. The Son is the sacrificed lamb and the Holy Spirit is the one who regenerates us. That we're dead in trespasses and sin, Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2. We were dead in our trespasses and sin, but he hath quickened us. That means he hath made us alive. He brought us to life through the power of the Holy Spirit, the regenerating power of the Holy Spirit. But we are washed in the blood of the lamb. And that leads us to the second point of our outline tonight, the praise of this great multitude. Note the words of praise in verse 11 and 12. And all the angels stood around the throne, and along with the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell face down before the throne, and they worshiped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and forever. Amen. Now in chapter 4 and 5, we notice that in heaven, there's a lot of praising, praise going on there. Praise was something that was constant. It was something that was consistent. 
It was something that was very exuberant. It was loud and it was very joyful. Now look at verse 11 again. Saying, and the angel stood around the throne and along with the elders and the four living creatures, they fell face down before the throne and worshiped God. And they, they said this doxology of, of praise. All the angels were standing there. All the angels were engaged in this worship around the throne. And the Bible tells us that there are 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands of angels. We said that the 24 elders were there. And we mentioned that these elders we believe to be another group of ruling, governing angels. And then there were the four living creatures. You will remember them. We said that they were cherubims. And they fell, all of them, this whole host, fell on their faces before the throne and they worship God. This verse tells us why they give praise to God. The angels are praising God for the salvation that he has given to these people from all nations, kindreds, and tongues. And that's interesting. Peter tells us that the angels long to look into this gospel because the gospel is not meant for angels. It was meant for men. When angels rebelled, they were expelled from heaven. When people rebelled, God sent his only begotten son to die for them. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. So angels stand amazed at what they see. They stand amazed as they are overwhelmed by God's mercy and by God's grace. And they rejoice in it, even though they are not the recipients of it. They are rejoicing because of what they see. They, they are just amazed at God's mercy and God's grace upon these, this great crowd of people. In Luke chapter 15, you will remember that there are three parables all dealing with lost things. You remember the parable of the lost sheep. The 90 and 9 were safe in the fold, but there was the one that was lost and how he went out and he went searching and looking for that one lost sheep. And when he rejoiced and when they, when, when they found that sheep, they, they rejoiced and the angels in heaven rejoiced. And the parable of the lost coin, the woman that lost the coin and invited the neighbors to come in and help her to find that coin. And they rejoiced when they found it. And the angels in heaven, the Bible says, rejoiced also. And then there's the parable of the prodigal son. You all know that's very familiar to all of us. And that boy that found himself wasted all of his substance and was eating with the pigs. And he said, when he came to his senses, he said, I will return to my father and Tell him I'm unworthy to be your son. And you remember the story how the father was waiting for the son to return. And when he saw him coming a long ways off, he ran to meet his son and threw his arms around him. And then he killed the fatted calf. And they had a great celebration. And the Bible tells us that the angels in heaven rejoiced over that one sinner that came to a saving knowledge of Jesus. So he came to his senses when the sheep is lost, the shepherd leaves the 99. When the woman was lost the, her coin, she called together her friends and neighbors. And when the prodigal son returns, think of it. The angels rejoice. They rejoiced when you came to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And I'm sure that the angels are going to rejoice this coming Sunday when we baptize those that are giving their heart to the Lord and saying, I want to follow Jesus Christ. And you're going to be there to witness that glorious occasion. And if the angels of heaven rejoice, we should rejoice also. And it should be, uh, we should be that much more committed to seek the lost and bring them to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. The search for them to rejoice over them and to disciple them for the Lord Jesus Christ. 
You will note also in verse 12 what the angels say. They say, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and forever. Amen. They say, Amen, because that means so be it. It's true, in other words, to what has just been proclaimed. They then ascribe seven attributes or qualities to or about God in verse 12. And it's interesting to note that all seven ascriptions have the definite article. It is awkward to translate it this way, but it actually is saying, Amen, the blessing and the glory and the wisdom and the thanksgiving and the honor and the power and the might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. He alone is worthy of this kind of praise. In other words, they aren't giving these things to him. He already possesses them. You see, they are just proclaiming it just like the angels did. They're proclaiming what God possesses. These are his attributes. And then that brings us to point three. And this is probably the most important part of this message that I hope you're going to get from the text this evening what it is showing us, what it wants us to understand, and that is the identity of this great multitude in verses 13 and 14. It says, Then one of the elders asked me, Who are these people? Yes, indeed, who are they? In white robes. Where did they come from? I said to him, that's John saying back to the angel that asked him the question, Sir, you know. And then he told me, these are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. Now where did they come from? They came, say it, out of the what? The great tribulation. They came out of the great tribulation. They washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Now, in verse 13, the great multitude is identified by a dramatic question addressed to John by one of the 24 elders. Then in verse 14, John answers, calling the angel, Sir, he says, You know. So this elder, which I believe to be an angel, responds to John by saying, these are the ones coming. Note that phraseology. These are the ones that are coming out of the great tribulation. This is in the present tense. These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. The great tribulation has the definite article. And it refers to that period of time beginning with the sealed judgments and going through the trumpet judgments on through the bowl judgments. In other words, the elder is telling John that this vast multitude that you see here before you, John, are believers who have died either through natural causes or by the martyrdom during that time that is known as the Great Tribulation. But wait a minute, preacher. I don't like that idea. I have been, never was taught that. I thought that the church was going to be raptured out of here before the Tribulation. And that the words come out or came out means that they came out by being raptured from the tribulation and never were to pass through it. Well, I respectfully disagree with that interpretation. And it is the one that I was taught in both schools, that Bible schools that I attended. And I say this after giving it many years of consideration and thought and reading hundreds and hundreds of books on this particular subject for several reasons. First of all, the elder plainly states that they were in the process 
of coming out of the great tribulation. This means that they had to be in it in order to come out of it. Secondly, in verse 16, you will note what it says. It says, they shall neither hunger nor thirst any more. And in verse 17, we read, and God will wipe every tear from their eyes. Now, this tells us something about this group of people that just showed up in heaven. It tells us of the trials that they had experienced while they were down here on the earth, suffering hunger and thirst. Well, what can you expect? We have four horses that were released at the beginning of this period of time. And the first horse we said was the Antichrist who gains victory after victory through diplomacy. He presents and provides a false peace for the world, which they are very ready to receive and look for. Then it says, but the red horse that followed this white horse had the power to take peace from the earth. So the first horse brings peace to the earth. The second horse brings warfare. And then that horse is followed by a black horse, which brings famine and pestilence, and then followed by death. So when you live in a world that is chaotic and having all of these judgments being brought down against it, we can understand why people would be suffering. We can understand why people would be hungry. We can understand why people would be thirsting. And, then when the, and the sun would be shining upon them to hot, scorching heat that is coming upon the earth. So we cannot ignore that this may refer to certain trials that they experienced while being on the earth during that period of time known as the Great Tribulation when, for example, it won't be possible to even buy food or drink without having the mark of the beast. Go to Revelation chapter 13 and look at verse 7 and 8. 13 at verse 7 and 8 it says, And it was permitted that it is speaking of the beast. And that beast is none other than the Antichrist. And it says that it was permitted, that means the Antichrist was permitted to wage war against the saints and to conquer them. So we have to take the word of God at face value. It says that the saints are going to be conquered that the saints are going to be hated by all the nations, and it says that it, the saints are going to be given over to the power of the Antichrist. It says, and it was permitted to wage war against the saints and to conquer them, and it was also given authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation. All those who live on the earth will worship it, everyone whose name is not written in the Lamb's Book of Life. So, we read in Revelation chapter 7 at verse 9 that this vast multitude, it says, is clothed in white robes. In other words, they are dressed exactly the same way as the martyrs that we found in Revelation chapter 6, 9 through 11. Revelation 6 at verse 9, we read these words. When he opened the fifth seal... I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slaughtered because of the word of God and the testimony they had given. And they cried out with a loud voice, Lord, the one who was holy and true, how long until you judge those who live on the earth and avenge our blood? So they were given white robes and they were told to rest. Now note these words. They were told to rest a little while longer until the number would be completed of their fellow servants and their brothers and sisters who were going to be killed just as they had been. So you will note <coughs> each of them was given white robes and they were told to wait a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and brothers who were to be killed as they were 
had been completed. And so it appears that the great crowd in chapter 7 is comprised of the martyrs and fellow servants and brothers who are slain in that little while. And that little while, incidentally, is given to us as to how long that little while actually is. We are told in Daniel and we're told in Revelation. We're going to be getting to these passages a little later on down the road as we study this book. But it is a period known as that period of the Great Tribulation, which is designated as a three and a half year period of time. It is also called 1260 days. It is referred to as 42 months. It is referred to as a time times and the dividing of time, which all the commentators are in agreement here, that that means three and a half years, period of three and a half years as well. So God has been very, uh, um, I say God has seen fit to give us this information in four different ways so that we would be sure to hear him. God, when he repeats himself, he wants us to get the message. He wants us to understand. And so it's a period of three and a half years. There's actually nothing in the Bible that says that the entire period of tribulation is a period of seven years. It does tell us in Daniel, the Daniel chapter 9 that there is 70 weeks of years that God has cut out of history in order to accomplish his purposes for his people. And he's going to do that in... 490 years. 483 years of, the, of those 70 weeks of years have been completed. There's only a period of seven years that needs to be fulfilled that is going to take place the last seven weeks or seven weeks of years, which is a total of seven years, and God will fulfill his purposes and complete his program for the Jewish people and for the world and which will bring us at the end of that 70th week to Armageddon. And after Armageddon comes the setting up of his kingdom here on the earth. Again, the text says that the people in this great multitude that John sees in heaven came out of the great tribulation. It's in the present tense and it shows continuous action. So this tells us that this group of people did not arrive in heaven all at the same time, which if they had been raptured, you would expect that they had been, they'd all come there at the same time. They got there together. But, it, but John sees them as though they are coming out of the tribulation, present tense, one by one by one, they are coming out of the tribulation. Their spirits are taken up to Beha to heaven and they are seen together assembled before the throne of God. So it tells us that in order to get to heaven, they had to die or to be martyrs. And as they were martyred, their spirits were transported to heaven one by one by one. Now why when these saints die do they stand in the presence of God? Well, because of who they are. They have been washed in the blood of the Lamb. They've made their robes white in His blood. So we see these white robes not only indicate victory, but also they indicate salvation. Salvation by justification and the work of Jesus Christ. In other words, they are cleansed. They have been made righteous. And how did that take place? It took place by being washed in the blood of the Lamb. Remember that old hymn, There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. I can remember my dad playing that on his banjo to us kids. Yes, to be washed by the blood of the Lamb is the only way to remove sin's guilty stains from us. You and I just can't do it because we are dead in our trespasses and sin. And Paul writes to the Ephesians, we need someone else to save us. And the only way that we can wear white robes, purified 
and cleansed is through the Lamb, the one who died on that cross. He is alone is the only one that can take away the sin of the whole world. And this is the way and the only way that people will be able to stand before God's wrath. So if you want to be sure that you're not going to come under the wrath of Almighty God is to be washed in the blood of the Lamb. And finally, we have the promises that are now made to this great multitude in verses 15 through 17. Let me read verses 15 through 17 again. For this reason, it says, they are before the throne of God and they serve him day and night in his temple. The one seated on the throne will shelter them and they will no longer hunger. They will no longer thirst. The sun will no longer strike them, nor will they any scorching heat. For the lamb is in the center of the throne. He will shepherd them. He will guide them to springs of the waters of life. And God will wipe every tear from their eyes. Because everyone in this vast multitude have had their robes made white in the blood of the lamb. They received the following gifts of grace from God. First of all, they have the wonderful privilege of standing before the throne of God. You're going to have that same privilege. Now you can have it the moment you die. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord Jesus Christ. You're going to stand before the throne of God if you live to see his coming and he's going to break through the clouds with a shout with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of Almighty God. The dead in Christ will rise first, and we which are alive and remain will be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. And you'll stand before the throne of God. Now, if we happen to be alive, and most of us probably won't be alive to experience this period that is known as the Great Tribulation, people have asked me how far down the road is it before that's going to occur. Well, the scripture is very clear. It says that no man knows the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man comes. I can't pinpoint a date. I'm not going to be numbered among those who have made that claim that Jesus is going to return. That So many of them have, ha have made that statement and made it publicly, and they've just lost their credibility. They've lost their credibility because Jesus didn't go. In 1948, people mentioned, well, now that Israel is back in the land, become a great nation, oh, surely it's just around the corner, just a matter of a few more years. And time has passed, decades have passed. He hasn't come back yet. So I'm very careful, very cautious about that. But, but the Bible says that we're to, to look for the signs of his coming. Jesus gave us Numerous signs that we are to look for. And he says, as the fig tree put forth leaves, you know that summer is nigh. And so likewise, when you see the trees, the budding of the fig tree, when you see the budding of the trees, you know that summer is nigh. You know also that the coming of the Son of Man is near. Lift up your head. Your redemption draweth nigh, he said, when you see these things. In Matthew chapter 24, Luke chapter 21, Mark chapter 13. And so they were granted the wonderful privilege of standing before the throne of God, which is something that every born again child of God is someday going to do. Stand before the presence of God. Think of it, just being brought into the very presence of God Almighty. They are also granted the privilege to serve him day and night. Think of that. We're going to live forever with the Lord and we're going to forever be indebted to Him and forever we're going to want to serve Him and we're going to have that privilege just as the angels. In fact, the, the, the Bible says that know ye not that someday you're going to even rule over angels. That's a great promise. Think of that. They are granted the privilege to serve Him day and night. We have been saved to serve. That's why we're saved. Serve him here and serve him forever when we get to heaven. 
And then the third blessing, he says, we are told that he who sits on the throne will shelter them. He's going to shelter them. And the idea is that he's going to spread his sovereign and good and loving care over all of them so that they will forever be protected and never have to face the dangers that they were exposed to while they were living down here on this earth. It's going to be a place of safety. It's a place of security, a place of rest. Wonderful promises that await the child of God. The fourth promise is, is that they will never again go hungry. They will never again experience thirst. Remember the promise that Jesus gave in his Sermon on the Mount. He said, blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. They shall be filled. Every longing, every longing of your heart. He's going to give you the desires of your heart. And every longing of your heart will be satisfied in that day. And then the fifth promise is, is the lamb in the center of the throne, it says, will be their shepherd. Jesus is not only the lamb of God, he is also the good shepherd. He said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd that gives his life for the sheep. Because as the lamb of God, he suffered and was a sacrifice for the sheep. And he now becomes the eternal shepherd for the sheep. The psalmist said, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Now John says, Jesus is that shepherd. I shall not want because he leads me beside the still waters and he restoreth my soul. The scripture says, I hath not seen, ear hath not heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those that love him. And then finally, and last of all, he says he's going to wipe every tear from their eyes. These are tears of sorrow. And in the world, he says, you will have tribulation. Man is born unto trouble as the sparks fly upward, Job said. And so there's lots of tears. There's tears we mourn the loss of our loved ones when they pass from us. These are tears of sorrow, but they will be washed away. There will be no more sorrow. There will be no more pain. All this and more awaits the servant of God and the followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, that completes our seventh chapter, praise God. And uh, we'll pick it up next week with chapter eight. Yes. Yes, well, uh, he is at this present time seated on, this is a vision you have to remember that John, John is experiencing. And he sees uh, God seated upon the throne. And he sees the, as the search went throughout heaven looking for someone who was worthy, then the Lamb appears. And he said, behold, the Lamb of God. And of course, this is reminding us of many things, the pictures of Christ that are given to us in the Word of God. When John the Baptist saw Jesus, he said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. And uh, he's still seated upon the right hand of the Father on high. Now, he's still there, waiting and anticipating that glorious day when he's going to be given this kingdom that we've been praying for for the past 2,000 years. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. On earth. And then he's coming to receive his own kingdom. I was just curious yeah. Well, let's close out in a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you again for allowing us this opportunity to be together around your word. And we recognize, Lord, that there are many difficult things 
in this book, things that we do not understand, we cannot even begin to imagine. But we know that your Holy Spirit will lead us into all truth. And we look to you to be our guide and be our teacher. Help us to meditate upon these things. Help us to search the scriptures. But be like, be like the Bereans who didn't even accept what the Apostle Paul told them and took it at face value. But they went and searched the scriptures to see for themselves if the things that they were being taught was so. So send us back to our homes and help us to get into your word and to study it and meditate upon it and to prayerfully seek to have the mind of Christ. We ask your blessing upon each one that's here and each one that's watching and, and studying this book online. We pray that your spirit will be with them and guide them in the things that they learn and the things that they study. May they, they together bring them into a closer walk and relationship with you. And I'll give you the praise, the glory, and the honor for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you.